HIV Program Manager at the Capacity for Health Project at the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum out of our San Francisco office. And I'll be serving today as your facilitator, and I'm joined here by our webinar administrator, HIV Program Assistant Vanessa Laurel, as well as our presenter for today's webinar, our subcontractor from the Life Foundation in Honolulu, Kathy Kapua. And I'll ask Kathy to formally introduce herself in just a few moments. So before we get started with this very exciting webinar topic on transgender cultural competence, there are a few housekeeping items to discuss. So first, uh, all participants have automatically been muted um, by our webinar administrator, Vanessa Laurel. And I just want to um, make one quick note that it's important to enter your access code as well as the PIN um, for you to participate in the audio portion of this webinar because um, we won't be able to unmute you later when you have questions um, unless you've entered your PIN. And then just secondly, um, to note that uh, there will be an opportunity to ask many questions after each topic session of this webinar. Um, and so during this uh, question section, you can do one of two things. You can either raise your hand to ask a question and we will call on you directly and unmute you. Or if you don't want to have your voice on for any reason, which is totally fine, you can use the question chat feature, which will be in your control panel. Um, please also note that this webinar is being recorded. And you can also access this webinar later by visiting our website at www.capacity4health.org. And later we will flash that so that you have it directly. Um, so just uh, next to say that this webinar is being hosted by the Capacity for Health Project. And we're a capacity building um, assistance provider project, which um, is located at the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, um, and out of our San Francisco office, but we also have a Washington, D.C. office. And we're funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, by the CDC, to provide free trainings and one-on-one -on -one technical assistance or capacity building uh, for community-based organizations. And we provide assistance in three major areas. One is around organizational infrastructure and program sustainability. So that might be around uh, board development or strategic planning or leadership development, for instance. We also provide free capacity building assistance in a second area of evidence-based interventions and public health strategies. And we're also trainers for four, uh, for four evidence-based interventions, which includes POL, Popular Opinion Leader, Empowerment, Focus on Youth with Impact, and Shield. Um, in addition to that, we can provide support for a lot of the other various things around evidence-based interventions and health strategies, such as helping organizations with their counseling, testing, and referral pro, um, policies and procedures, or getting clear waivers, or around facilitation or recruitment and retention. And so the options are limitless. Um, and then the last area that we're funded to provide free capacity building assistance around is monitoring and evaluation. So we have a lot of organizations that need assistance with um, the monitoring and evaluation of their specific interventions, but also of their overall programs or, for instance, developing quality assurance plans um, but, or data management, various things. Um, so lastly, just to note that priority for capacity building assistance is given to CDC's directly funded organizations and then to their indirectly funded organizations. Um, next, I want to note that um, Capacity for Health, which again is our, is our capacity building assistance project at the Health Forum, um, has been very uh, strongly supported for over the last 10 years by a wonderful subcontractor who is the Life Foundation. And they're located in Honolulu. Um, and we've worked with them um, for many years now. And they really help to support our capacity building work in the Hawaiian Islands as well as in the Pacific jurisdictions. Um, before I turn it over to Kathy Kapoor at the Life Foundation to present on this topic, um, there's just a, a couple quick notes that I want to make regarding evaluating this webinar. So the first thing is that um, we realize that some people who may be listening right now on this webinar may be sharing a, a, a webinar login password with a colleague. For instance, you might be sitting in a conference room with somebody else. You may have not registered yourself personally. 
it's really our goal to provide the most useful capacity building assistance possible, um, ensuring that our products and services are relevant and also targeted appropriately. So in order to do this, we take evaluation very seriously, and we strive to evaluate all of our services from our participants. So if any of you out there right now are listening on and you've not personally registered for this webinar, we ask you to do one thing very quickly. If you could please go to the control panel, which is probably on the right side of your screen, you'll see a chat pane. If you could please type in your name, your organization, and your email address. Um, and if you, there's a drop-down menu that's um, for on the chat portion where you can choose to staff, which is sent only directly to us and not to everyone. And so only we will see your contact information. But that will let us know that you have not registered, but that you are participating. And this gives us an opportunity after this webinar to send you an evaluation directly to your email address, um, just as we're going to do the same to all registered webinar participants. And so to incentivize, incentivize your honest feedback um, from you and as well as all participants um, on this webinar, we're providing gift cards to participants who complete the evaluation. So if you have any questions about how to send us your information, please go ahead and just side, send a note on the, the chat side, on the, um, in the chat pin on the side. So now I am going to turn this webinar over to my very esteemed colleague, Kathy Kapua, from the Life Foundation who will present on this webinar. Kathy, you there? Hi, thank you, Nikki, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so glad to be asked to speak on behalf of the Native Hawaiian, Asian Pacific Islander transgender community and really to give this webinar to build some cultural competency. On your slide, on the screen, you'll go ahead and see my name and my contact information. And I want to list out that my legal name is now Kathy Kiana Keiko Kapua, and that is my legal name. But I was born David Alexander Kapua, Jr., and it's very empowering for me to say this, that I am a transgender woman, and I have lived in Hawaii my whole life. I also have a performing name and a drag name and a house name, and that name is Taffy. So I go ahead and respond to either Kathy or Taffy, whichever you feel most comfortable with. But here at Life Foundation, I'm an HIV prevention specialist, as well as a SIBA provider for here in the Pacific, as well as a transgender advocate. If you want to know more about some of our programs offered at the Life Foundation, you can go ahead and visit us at www.lifefoundation.org. <coughs> Let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we actually start the content of this webinar, I wanted to go ahead and cover some of our objectives we'll be covering throughout this this afternoon. Um, by, we hope to increase knowledge around the social structures and culture of the Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander transgender community. We also hope to increase your knowledge and understanding around the slang and terminology used by the Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander transgender community. We also hope to increase the skills by providing culturally relevant counseling for Native Hawaiian, Asian, Pacific Islander, transgender community, as well as increase your knowledge and understanding around slang and terminology around appropriate services and referrals for the transgender community. Before we actually start some of the content, I wanted to go ahead and poll our audience and our participants today on the call to see your knowledge and your experiences working with the transgender community. So I wanted to know, how many Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander transgender do you currently work with? Go ahead and select your answer on the poll screen listed in front of you. If you have more than 10, you can go ahead and check that box. Between 5 and 9, go ahead and check that box. Between 1 and 5 transgender clients you're currently working with, go ahead and check that box. Or if you're currently not working with any transgender clients, go ahead and check the None box. We'll go ahead and give you a few seconds to complete the poll. Excellent. Thank you so much for your participation. And the lovely Vanessa went ahead and showed us the poll results. So it seems like about half of the people on the call right now are familiar with and have a lot of experience working with the Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander transgender community. We also see some other areas where agencies are working with or wanting to work with or have select few transgender um, clients in their agency. 
Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and start with our presentation. So first off, I wanted to talk about the culture. Culture is defined as patterns of human activity and symbolic structures that give activities significance and importance. There can be various di different common factors that could bring a community together. Some examples that we will be discussing in the future slides are transgender specific issues, issues around being transgender and belonging to the community, as well as Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander specific ethnic and demographic commonalities in their culture. Next, I also wanted to point out the importance of family. <clears throat> family is an important part in all of our Pacific Islander culture. As a provider, it is important for us to consider the impact of the family unit when designing programs. Some members of the community may not have their biological family's acceptance, yet still may have the desire to belong to a family unit. This is where the concept of hanai, or adoptive family, comes into importance. Through friendship groups, the Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander transgender community may form family units that they can relate and connect with. By sharing life experience with people who have similar stories, they create a bond that an individual really needs to feel accepted and feel part of their community. The transgender community especially may feel this disconnect from their biological families. So through houses or drag families, they are able to find support <clears throat> from parental figures. This is important to know when doing an assessment or counseling session when you ask, what kind of support do you have? Many local born transgender persons may list their mother or their sister as a supportive member of their family. Further questionings may be needed to ask if, this is, if they are biological family members or Hanai family members. <clears throat> there are several other practices and traditions in these Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander transgender communities. <clears throat> As part of local culture, food is commonly shared during gatherings and conversation. This factor could be important when recruiting into a support group or providing services or conducting a program with the local transgender community. As a counselor, you may be wanting to explore deeper conversations with your transgender clients. So by providing some kind of food or snack, you'll be helping them to become more comfortable with you, in turn building their trust. Na'au, or gut feeling or instinct, is something that may, many communities can relate to when speaking about their culture. This can be interpreted differently with each person, but it's generally pushing a person to do the morally correct thing. Sometimes when conversations arise around sex work amongst the transgender community, they might have gut feeling or instincts about certain situations. Being able to explore this could help your counseling session. <clears throat> Mo'olelo, or story, is reflected in many Pacific Island cultures. Whether young or old, every person in every family has a story to be told of how they came to be. This is important to understand when working with these communities that sometimes by understanding their background and other non-related topics, you can better understand a person's intent or thinking process. By asking questions to find out if they're a performer or a musician during the evening could help you understand their availability for meeting you at an early morning appointment. <laughs> by spending a little more time to delve into these areas, you also build long-lasting rapport with your clients. Mahu is a native Hawaiian word for a two-spirited person who is either homosexual or of dual genders. <clears throat> it is important to know that this is not considered taboo by our Hawaiian ancestors, but in fact embraced. <clears throat> the mahu was held in high regard because it is an honor to have a person who can both help care for the kupuna and the keiki, which is our elderly and our children, also alongside with the women of the village, as well as strong and courageous to hunt and protect the village, like the men would do. Many Pacific Island cultures have history of these two-spirited persons and may still, to this day, respect and honor a two-spirited person. In Samoa, we have the Fafafinge. In Tonga, we have the Fakaleti. In Tahiti, we have the Mahuti. And in New Zealand, we have the Takatapui. Aikane is loosely defined as a close personal friend, but later, but has been later translated as a person of the same gender whom you may share your bed with. It is with this thinking that without any Western taboos, 
It was culturally accessible to share your bed and your sex with your close personal friends. This concept extended to both women and men who have same gender partners. It is not until the Christian missionaries came into the Hawaiian Islands in 1820 did the concept of Western religion come into Native Hawaiian culture. This is when the concept of mahu and ikane started becoming un unacceptable. <coughs> mahu is defined as a man who assimilates his manner and dresses his person like a woman. When the concept of the mahu started becoming an unacceptable part of society, it also stirred feelings of sadness, distress, and eventually suicide for those persons identified as mahu. In today's society, there is still a negative connotation around the use of this word that many transgender individuals don't identify with this native Hawaiian word. This person, who was once held in high regards, is now an abomination to the culture. These feelings of separation have led transgender persons to sh into shame for being who they are and hinders them from being all that they could be. The Native Hawaiian didn't have recorded history, and many of their history was passed down through generations through oral traditions. This was made it difficult in recording the pre-existence of the mahu when the missionary came to the island. This entry on your screen from the journals of Reverend Cochrane Forbes dated back in 1838, which gives us some light of the mahu approaching the reverend wanting to be a part of Christianity. This shows us some of the difficulties the mahu was being challenged with in ancient Hawaii. One man who has never dressed in male costume from his birth now labors under conviction. He appears truly humbled, but says he does not know how to change his dress. I told him that if he would be a follower of Jesus, he must make no reserves, but must be willing to sacrifice everything. Poor fellow, he has had a hard conflict with his pride, but the sinner must be willing to anything for Christ. <clears throat> with the start of the health and social service programs for these disenfranchised communities, Kuli and Amamo, a transgender social service organization in the state of Hawaii, and the members of the community reclaim this cultural word with pride have, have termed themselves mahu wahine, meaning transgender women. The same concept can be applied for transgender men using the word mahu kane. This changed the negative connotation of the word mahu and has been one that many Native Hawaiian transgender can now identify with. This word is not designed for providers to use unless the client can identify with this word. So I wouldn't suggest ever calling someone a mahu wahine unless you yourself are mahu wahine or if you personally know that this person can identify with this word. <clears throat> like previously mentioned, many Pacific Islanders have a place in their culture for the two-spirited community. There still may be some sense of shame and stigma around being transgender, but not as commonly found in more rural settings. In many other cultures around the world, Many two-spirited communities have maintained their level of, of acceptance among society. The Navajo tribes have the Nadle, who are functioning members of their society. In Thailand, they have the Katoi, who have been one of the largest tourist attractions in the entertainment industry for Thailand. Their performances of dance and song have intrigued visitors from far and wide. In India, there are the Hedras, who are still believed to have the power to bless families with good fortune and healthy children. And lastly, on this topic area, I wanted to cover gender identity. It is important to respect that an individual really has the choice to choose their identity, and their identity is one sense of one's own gender. With that being said, I wanted to ask, what questions do you have now? Like Nikki mentioned earlier, you can go ahead and use your chat box feature on your right-hand side and go ahead and type in your questions now. If you would like to go ahead and ask your questions verbally, you can go ahead and raise your hand using the raise your hand feature, and one of our moderators will go ahead and unmute you, and you can ask your question. So what questions do you have around gender identity and the mahu culture? Thank you. We'll go ahead and if there's no other questions, we can go ahead and move forward. Please know that I'm also available to answer questions as the webinar continues. If you have a question about a particular slide, you can go ahead and chat that in on your right-hand panel on the side. 
we'll go ahead and move forward. Now we're going to talk about the same-sex relationship as well as the sexual orientation of a person. Ikane is defined as to cohabit um, as male with male or female with female. This community also shares the struggle of mahu where they were now feeling isolated from society and unable to openly express their feelings toward loved ones. Bisexuality. Dr. Kamile Hiva is a professor at UH Manoa who stated this comment about bisexuality in ancient Hawaiian days. And I'll go ahead and read this passage if I may. In traditional times, it was really okay if men who slept with men also slept with women, and women who slept with women also slept with men. If that was okay, then what is homosexuality and what is heterosexual? Why is there a dividing line? It seems to me in the West you have to either be hetero or homo. You cannot be both. In the West, they still deny that bisexuality exists, but we know it was very common, if not the norm, in traditional Hawaii. So we can clearly see that identity is a little different and a lot different around our sexual orientation. It's very important to know that the gender of a person and who a person is sexually attracted to are two very different things. Gender identity is a how a person identifies his or her role and how that person chooses to present themselves to the world. Our sexual orientation refers to who the person finds sexually attractive this can be a person of the opposite gender, the same gender, or both. <clears throat> With that being said, there are several different categories of gender. For this area, we'll talk about male, female, transgender male, and transgender female. If our orientation is defined by homosexual, meaning attracted to persons of the same gender, and heterosexual, meaning attracted to persons of the opposite gender, as well as bisexual, meaning attracted to persons of both the same gender and the opposite gender. If a person identifies as female and is attracted to another female, they could be considered homosexual or gay. The same situation would apply if a transgender female and a transgender female are attracted together. This would be also a gay or homosexual relationship. If a male is attracted to a female, they are considered heterosexual. So then if a person identifies as a transgender woman and is sexually attracted to men because they are because they are out of another gender, they are considered a homo a heterosexual couple. With that being said, what questions do you have regarding sexual orientation of our community? You can go ahead and time in your answers, your questions on the side chat box on your right hand side of the screen. Seems like we do have a question from one of our viewers. And the question comes from Oahu. How does the current Hawaiian community feel about the mahu today? That is a very excellent question, and I do believe that um, every Hawaiian has their right and their views and opinions about certain issues, and this mahu issue is also something um, of, of great concern in a lot of lengthy relationships and conversations that happen. And really, the community um, has, has the ancient Hawaiian community really recognized that the important role of the mahu. So in today's society, I still believe the Native Hawaiian community is very much more accepting of the mahu community. Um, with that being said, I think it's a greater understanding and an open relationship that communication is always back and forth. Thank you so much, Oahu. We have another question coming from the Big Island. I was wondering what a transgender female and female relationship would be considered. Excellent question coming from the Big Island. Um, a transgender female being attracted to a person who is um, biologically female would still be a heterosexual relationship. It doesn't matter the type of sex or sexual actions that they engage in, but it really is more that the identity of a person is a little bit different. It, um, because they are both not transgender females or they are both not biological females, they are of a different gender, and so they are heterosexual. We have another question coming from the Big Island. 
which is similar about a TG female and a female. So really because they are coming from a different gender, being that there are four genders that I mentioned, if we put them all in categories, we have the male, which is biological male. We have female, which is a biological female. We have a self-identified transgender woman and a transgender male. So with those four categories, if they are dating someone of the same gender, then they would be considered homosexual or gay. If they are dating someone of the other gender, of any of the other four genders, then it would be heterosexual because they're not of the same gender. Thank you for asking. We have another question coming from Kauai Island. A TG female and a male are considered heterosexual. Excellent question. Yes, I'm saying that a transgender female who is attracted to a biological male is considered a heterosexual couple, irregardless of the type of sex that they actually have, who is the top, who is the bottom, and how their genitals actually fit. Their gender roles and defining their sexual orientation really depends on if, it's, if they are from the same gender. So if a transgender female dated another transgender female, that situation would be a homosexual relationship. Thank you for that question. I also see comments saying that on the Big Island and in Hawaii in general, we have a lot of relationships that are of mix and is not of the typical um, normal thoughts of what a, a heterosexual couple or a homosexual couple looks like. So thank you for pointing that out on the Big Island. And we also have a clarifying question coming from Kauai Island, whether the pers if that transgender person has had surgery to prolong or to progress her um, transition into whatever gender she identifies as, then yes, that really depends on what she is categor categorizing her own or identifying her own gender identity. So if she is a preoperative, so before surgery, transgender woman, and she is attracted to biological male, she is still heterosexual. If she go ahead and has a sex reassignment surgery and now she's a post-operative transgender woman, if she identifies still as a transgender woman or of a woman and she's attracted to a biological male, she is still heterosexual because she is not dating someone of her same gender. Excellent clarifying question from Kauai. <clears throat> we have other questions. It, yes, once again, clarifying, it doesn't um, necessarily mean in regards to her surgeries or her, her um, appearance or how she projects herself with um, cosmetic surgery or enhanced herself with cosmetic surgery. Excellent. And I see we have a lot of the similar questions around the same. Thank you so much, everyone, for going ahead and using the chat box feature. I find that it works a lot easier when we can see the questions on the screen. I also have a question coming from Big Island. How about a transgender man and a heterosexual man? So the heterosexual male, it would actually be a biological male. So how about a transgender male, which is a mahukane, or a person born female and now living their life as a male, is now attracted to a biological male. In that situation, they are not both the same, because a transgender person is a little different than a biological person's gender identity. So they would still be considered a heterosexual relationship, even though both people may appear to be male and male. That relationship would still be a hetero. They're not dating someone of the same gender. Thank you so much for your questions. We'll go ahead and move on to the rest of our presentation. Actually, I would like to go ahead and poll to see the knowledge of our group. It seems like a lot of people answered these questions already. So our next slide would be our poll question. Um, and you can go ahead and use a polling feature on your screen. If a mahu wahine, or a transgender woman, is sexually attracted to a heterosexual male, what is her sexual orientation? Let's see our knowledge base on, from our participants online. You can go ahead and check your answer box. If you think that that couple would be considered a homosexual couple, go ahead and check that homosexual box. If you think this mahu wahine, in this example, is um, attract, being attracted to a heterosexual male is now considered a transgender woman, go ahead and check that box. If you feel this person is a heterosexual relationship, go ahead and click that box. And if you're still unsure, go ahead and check the unsure of answer box and we'll go ahead and discuss it a little bit more. So go ahead and use your polling feature and in a few seconds we'll have a closeout of the poll. 
and we'll see our results on screen. Excellent. So it seems like if that Mahon Wahine transgender woman is sexually attracted to heterosexual men, her sexual orientation would be, by unanimous decision of all our participants as well as myself, being a transgender woman, we would consider that person, uh, that relationship a heterosexual relationship. So it seems like you got it. Let's go ahead and try one more time. We have another polling question for your access on screen. And the lovely Vanessa will put that up. If a mahu wahine or transgender woman is sexually attracted to a mahu kane or a, a transgender man, what is her sexual orientation? Go ahead and check the box. If you think that per this relationship is a homosexual relationship, if you think this relationship is bisexual, go ahead and click that box. If you think it's heterosexual relationship, go ahead and click that box. And if you're still unsure of the answer, go ahead and click that box and we can go ahead and discuss it a little further. We take a few more seconds to close out the polls. And in a few seconds, we'll go ahead and see our poll results. <clears throat> Excellent. So that Mahu Wahine and that Mahu Kane are in a heterosexual relationship. Although they both are living as transgender people, they are both identifying as different genders of the transgender sort. So they are both heterosexual. And this is a heterosexual couple. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all your participation around our polls. We'll go ahead and get back to our screen, our presentation. Now we wanted to talk a little bit more about the mahu slang. Here in Hawaii specifically, we have a lot of different um, languages and a lot of cultures that come together here that create our mahu slang. If you are comfortable with any of the Asian Pacific Islander um, languages, then you can find a lot of commonalities between the languages, as well as a lot of it is um, fun language or a language that has been developed over time. And we're just going to be covering some of the main ones that some of my colleagues was able to help me um, discuss. I also want to make mention that the following definitions are designed to enhance your understanding of the local mahu slang so that you can better enable your counseling sessions to run a little more smoothly, as well as for you to be able to increase some of the rapport you build with the transgender community, as well as to better assess some of the risk behaviors if a word comes up and you actually have to stop the conversation to rewind and what was that word, you might lose the content of what the transgender client is now trying to tell you. These definitions are not designed so that you can use these words and try to be down with the community. And that's very important for me to say that it's great for you to know the language and to understand what it means, but not necessarily OK for you to go ahead and use that when speaking with the transgender community directly. So first off, we have a few mahu slang terminology that um, is developed from around sex work. The word pooch, or looking for sex, whether it be for money or pleasure, is commonly used when especially engaging in sex work or looking for um, a partner for the evening. Um, I'll use an example of how this look, could look like in our community. Uh, if a transgender woman and another transgender woman are talking to each other, they could be like, hey girl, are you going to pooch this weekend? Where are you going to pooch at? You going to pooch down Merchant Street, or are you going to go run down Waikiki and pooch over there? That's how the word would actually be used. It's a language, and it's really a slang word. And it's pronounced pooch. The next two words are two different words that sometimes get a little confused. I really wanted to cover it. This language can also be commonly found in, um, in the US mainland transgender communities. And it's a commonly found word in sex industry workers. The word trick refers to a person who exchanged sex for drugs or money or something that they need. So if you are engaging in sex work and you pick up a john or a date, that person is also referred to as a trick. If you wanted to use it as a verb and actually make it like I'm tricking or I'm out there working, then it's similar. You can use the same word and you make it into a verb and say I am out looking for a trick or I am out tricking. Trade. Trade is a person who identifies as a heterosexual, may or may not be in a relationship, but is attracted to a transsexual or transgender person for sexual pleasure. This is important to know um, that this might not necessarily be 
all around sex work, but it does have to do in regards to describing the person they're going to have sex with or trying to pooch or looking for sex with. Um, the word trade really is a person who normally wouldn't or is not your typical idea of a person who's attracted to a transgender. This person this person is really on the stealth mode or really on the down low and really is um, attracted to that person, whether it be a transgender female or a transgender male, that person is just um, wanting to have sexual pleasure with that transgender person. And that heterosexual person is considered a trait. Moving on, we have some beauty words amongst the Mahu community. The word fish could be considered um, is definitely considered a compliment amongst the transgender community, but it really refers to anything feminine or ladylike or girly. Um, we use this more as an adjective, but it also can be used as a noun. And when we say that is like, oh, that's a fish top, it really is saying that is a very feminine, ladylike or girly top. I really like that top. It's something of, um, of, of quality that I enjoy. You can also refer to fish as a biological woman. Sometimes a biological woman could be offended by this referral, but please know that in the transgender community, because a lot of our transgender women are wanting to aspire to appear feminine or like a biological woman, the word fish also refers to a biological woman. <laughs> the word P means anything perfect to pretty. So it's, it's a compliment used to design to describe something that is going on. Oh, that's a P, P your nails, girl. Oh, where you got that top from? Oh, that's so P. And that's how the word is really used. It's just to describe something perfect to pretty. The word mug refers to face or makeup. It can also be used when referring to sex work. This can be used hand in hand, but really in general, the word mug refers to your face, like in regards to getting arrested and having a mug shot. It's a picture shot of your just your face. When a transgender community uses this word, it really refers to your face or the process of putting on your makeup. So when I say, oh, girl, I'm going to go beat my mug this weekend because I want to hit it and go pooch out at Fusions this weekend. Thoughts like that or conversations like that really come about and really understanding that when they said mug, it could mean just to make their face pretty and to put their best face forward. And when we talk and refer to it in sex work, it really is I'm giving a pretty mug out on the street or pretty mug with the hopes to entice someone for um, sexual pleasure for, for sex work. Further, um, some other Mahu slang terms I wanted to also mention in here that could be confusing for a person who is not familiar, but to hear these words um, is, is really important. I have the word P up here, um, again, meaning perfect to pretty, and it's really important to know that um, it's not okay if you are not part of the community to use that, com that word to somebody else. I get this very frequently. I can be shopping at Long's or putting gas and somebody comes up to me who is not of my community, never saw them before, and comes up to me and says, oh girl, so pee your nails. And it's a little offensive because then I'm automatically assuming this person is um, recognizing that I am of the transgender community and that I could possibly not be a, a, hetero a biological female. Another compliment or word that also fits into these terms is sickening, lovely, ova, or flawless. All of these words are used exactly like how I just said it and in replace of each other. Um, you can use if that top that the person is wearing is really nice, you, instead of saying it's a fish top, which means it's a girly or pretty top, I can be like, oh girl, that's a sickening top. Where you got that from? And that's how it come up. Um, in replace, you can also <laughs> use other language, like lovely, that's a lovely top, girl. Oh, over that top, where you got them from? And then flawless, same thing, oh, flawless, girl. Not always is the word girl attached to it, that is just my slang and my language, and that's how I use it, so I just really wanted to point that out for the purpose of this webinar. The word gorge is short for gorgeous or fabulous, meaning it's a compliment or something good. It also could be very attractive. So if I found a guy walking by and I was attracted to that guy, I'd be like, oh, gorge. And then just by saying that, a lot of other of my sisters might be able to understand that there is a gorgeous person walking around here So to look for who I'm referring to. 
the word DAC is really a term of agreement, and it's, an ex it's like an exclamation mark at the end of a sentence. So if I really like that person's top that they're wearing, and um, I agree with somebody else saying something, I use the word DAC. So, oh, gorgeous that top, girl. Yeah, you don't think so. The other person would be like, oh, DAC. So really it's a, a term of agreement. That other person is agreeing that that is a pretty top. Um, you can also use it as an exclamation point. So you can like, oh, I'm so tired, back. That back really just acts as an exclamation mark saying that, exclamation mark saying that I'm very tired. The word T, or the letter T, I should say, could be used as a way to address friends or other transgenders in the community, or it also means the truth. So when somebody is clocking your T, they also could be clocking your T in regards to you being transgender, but it also means to be clocking your truth. So if my being transgender is not even the topic of conversation, but um, I was actually sick, and um, somebody said, I, but I saw you out shopping, then they're clocking your truth, or they're identifying your T. Yeah? So that's how those words can be used in several different situations. We have other Mahu terms that I also wanted to cover. Um, feeding is to give a compliment sarcastically. Reading is to set somebody straight. Both of these can go hand in hand, and sometimes it's hard to determine whether a person is being sarcastic or is actually being just rude. Um, feeding really looks like when somebody is giving it, oh, that is a really nice top. I really like that top. I'm going on and on about that top, but actually when I turn around, I'm thinking that's really not a cute top. To read somebody really means to set somebody straight. Oh, girl, that top is all small for you. It doesn't fit you. Everything's still hanging out. I can see your colors in the back. That is setting somebody straight, letting them know exactly how you feel. Another person would, another transgender person would identify that as reading. I was really hurting someone's feeling directly. The word muffy refers to our homosexual communities, our gay or feminine acting males in our community. Um, it's used hand in hand. Um, it doesn't mean this disrespectful way of calling someone out as a homosexual or a feminine acting male. It is more a softer way of saying it and also it depends on the context of the person saying the word muffy. Drag, as many people I'm sure on the call know, is to dress up as a person of the opposite sex or to dress up with ex over, ex over exaggerated fashion. This can be flashy, flary, could be considered more club kid, could be over the top and unusual, and this would be considered drag. I know we covered a lot of um, Mahu slang terms, so I wanted to go ahead and open up the questions once again. Um, do you have any questions for me around some of the language that was used or some of the examples that I did that wasn't necessarily um, um, Claire, you can go ahead and use your chat box feature right now, and I can go ahead and answer some of those questions. Excellent. It seems like everybody understood a lot of my slang or my examples around the slang. So we will go ahead and move forward and talk a lot more about the social structures of, our, of the transgender community, as well as the services offered here in Hawaii. It's important to know that there are several subcultures that could happen within one particular community. Age and generations really could play a part in who the community identifies with and can relate with. Sex work or non-sex work can really also help identify if a person can relate to another person of the same community, as well as the location and where they're located. Um, although a lot of the transgender women on Big Island also are familiar with the women on Hawaii Island and the transgender women here on Oahu Island, um, the location really forms their subcultures and a lot of their cliques. It's also important to know here on the island of Oahu, as well as in the state of Hawaii, we have houses and connections, um, Hanai families like we talked about earlier. Some specific ones I will name on the board here we have is the Chandelier family, Ashton, Armani, Daniels, the Jacobs, the Lamores, the Williams, and the Love Childs. And those are just some. Um, examples of large houses here in Hawaii. Um, in the mainland, this is also important, and other names have carried on into the islands as well. But nonetheless, it's very important for many of our trans Native Hawaiian, Asian, Pacific Islander, transgender women and men 
to have that family unit and support. Some of our local transgender issues, um, they, of course, are still being faced with stigma and shame amongst the community. It can be unbearable sometimes for them to step out of their house during the daylight hours if a person is very uncomfortable with their appearance. For example, sometimes their 5 o'clock shadow might be popping up at noon o'clock, and that might be an issue. So they might not be able to come into your office at a morning visit just because they are uncomfortable walking out into the um, society. Um, being disowned from their biological family is very important to mention and also is better for us to understand if we can understand that not every agency or not every family is accepting of their child's um, behaviors or life choices. Um, sometimes the not at my dining room table really means I might be okay with some of my families or my other friends having gay children or having um, a, a, gay, a transgender person in their family, but when it comes to their own family, it's a different story. It's uncomfortable for them to deal with. Appearance. A lot of our, myself included, have issues around our appearance, whether we not we fit into society, whether or not we're going to get our teeth clocked and our truth is going to be revealed that we are transgender. Um, that's always legitimate issues amongst the transgender community. Other things to take into consideration is substance use, how we deal and how my community might cope and deal with um, situations that are stressful really um, could be impactful if you could understand. Substances as well as alcohol can really make a difference. Access to services such as the hours of operation for your program, the location and transportation of, the, of your clients, as well as the lack of knowledge of transgender services or not being able to refer someone out to other agencies that have transgender programming. Hey, Kathy, we have a question. Someone's raised yeah. their hand, someone named Mookie. So, uh, if, so we're going to go ahead and unmute um, the line right now so this person can ask the question. Thank you so much, Nikki. Go ahead, Mookie. Hello, I'm Mom. sorry. I, 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 that was a mistake. I was going <laughs> to... There was a question. I just kind of clicked it. Oh, okay. no problem. Thank you so much for raising your hand. That means I know you're on board. I'm Thank here. You for joining. Thank <laughs> you for joining our webinar. I'll go ahead and continue with some of our barriers to our services. Um, of course, um, we mentioned the stigma and shame, but it's also a different story when a transgender person comes to access services and they get there and they feel they're being judged. Um, this can be uncomfortable and really be the point of that transgender person not understanding or not wanting to access services anymore. A simple thing also like not being addressed as they present. If a person comes in with beautiful makeup on and a nice hair piece and maybe um, a padded bra that is a little exaggerated and um, a beautiful dress on, and you call him, or you call her him, it really makes a difference on how comfortable that person feels now. If they're gone out of their way to make sure they felt comfortable, by you calling them that one he or she can really, pronoun can really make a difference on how comfortable that person feels from them to that point on. It really breaks a lot of rapport too if you don't recognize them for how they present. Another thing, another tip or barrier, a barrier is being having to call them by their legal name. And a great tip is to also on your assessment forms and your intake forms as well as on your notes and your progress notes to have a preferred name box or a place up on the top that's very visible, right next to the legal name. So if you ever have to make a choice, you know what name that person really prefers. Really can build some rapport with your clients. As well as the limited access, we talked about transportation and the hours of operation for the community to come and access your services. A big issue now as well is the money or uninsured, um, uninsured populations. Of course, we know that here in Hawaii, every resident is afforded a medical insurance, but sometimes that medical insurance doesn't cover a lot of our transgender needs. Um, me, myself, I access hormone therapy, and sometimes it's very costly even with the insurance. I can only imagine how much it would cost with no insurance. The stigma and shame I mentioned one more time because it's very important. And also the guilt by association. And I put that down here because we at Life Foundation are an AIDS service organization. So we do everything to stop HIV and AIDS here in the Pacific. But really, we have a lot of transgender services also offered here at Life Foundation. And maybe some of the transgender women might not want to access that program 
here at the Life Foundation because it's an aid service organization. So we've been able to identify some of these things and actually hold groups or support groups and um, functions outside of the office setting, not identifying it or connecting it with Life Foundation. Some tips continuing on to providing services is really providing that safe place, really having them feel comfortable when they come into your waiting room. It really starts from the first person they interact with, which is the reception, all the way down to when they're walking out and they're leaving in your parking structure. Focus on the client's need, not necessarily their gender identity or their sexual orientation. If a person is coming in for um, asthma-related um, issues, and they're breathing, that you really might not need to know necessarily information about who they had sex with or how their sex work is going. Unless it comes up and it's something that they want to talk about, it's really her need is that she's telling you would be about her asthma, for this example. Provide support groups. Really having peer-led groups or groups where they can come in and share their mana'o or their um, experiences with others of the community really can help build the community and in turn they will identify the support being given from your agency which is we have found at Life Foundation very effective in getting recruitment into our program. Always hiring a local transgender staff member really does open up opportunities for your programs to um, increase recruitment, to get the word of your messages out there. It's always great to hire someone from that community. One-on-one um, -on -one counseling and really so focusing and tailoring the counseling session according to what that person is talking about. So like we talked about keeping the conversation one-on-one -on -one, and in that process you would definitely have to build rapport first before they start trusting you and telling you the real serious things. Accompany them to their appointments, and I myself am guilty of it. I am a transgender woman and very proud of it, but sometimes it's a little difficult for me to walk through um, a shopping mall just to go get that one item that I need. So I can understand that even though it's um, great and you might not be able to walk all your clients to all of their appointments, really accompanying them, maybe even on the first appointment, could really break some of their own personal barriers down. They'll feel supported as well as they'll see that there's really nothing to fear. So accompanying them and doing a hard referral is really key in getting them to access their own services and building, empowering them to access it for themselves. And lastly, I also have one here, is to manage our own discomforts. A lot of times, um, hearing who they had sex with, how they had sex, could be alarming for us. So really discover whether you need to know this information, or if this is information this person really wants to tell you. And being comfortable with it, not being necessarily about you as the counselor, but more about providing the best service for your client. <clears throat> and in turn, all of these things will provide will create a client-centered experience for you and your clients at your agencies. We also want to make mention that um, by having community building events, you start to form a network of each other, of Native Hawaiian, Asian, and Pacific Islander, transgender community who can come in and support each other. You also start to see the ikane or the men the gay men or the gay women might start to come together and form an alliance and form a larger community with the transgender community. Having groups, really, by having food, once again mentioned, I'm pretty sure you are aware now that by providing food as an incentive, you get a larger crowd and people are more inclined to come and stay and enjoy whatever programs, information, or education you're offering at your session. By having workshops fun, exciting, innovative, and having them outside of the office really creates a fun experience that people want to come back and continue accessing your services. By, ex having, by exciting them and empowering your core group to recruit and facilitate, you can get the message out there greater if members of the community are talking about your program as in a good light and recruiting people into your program in a good light, as opposed to only your outreach workers or your recruitment staff out there trying to get the community involved. Incorporating activities um, really makes a difference. I think by um, hands-on experiences, people learn a lot more than hearing it and writing things down. So you can see in some of our pictures, um, we have condom demonstrations going on and live models with our, our fake dildos really help a lot 
in the demonstration process and people actually see how it is to put a condom on in the dark or to put the condom on with using no hands or how to actually do all the steps up to putting a condom on, like making sure they check the expiration date and how they dispose of the condom. These are fun activities that we created at the Life Foundation for all of our programs and we found have been very effective and successful. And lastly, I wanted to talk about some of our program marketing, which we feel is very important. By putting local positive transgender community members on your promotional materials, you really get a lot more impact. Here on our top left corner, we have the lovely Madeline Ashton, who is a gatekeeper in the community, a performer in, her, in the clubs, as well as in, um, several national title holders. She um, made a great spokesperson for this campaign that we had several years back called Lick HIV. Um, she is dressed in some of her attire that makes the girls want to look, and also transgender women are more attracted uh, to look at somebody that and can relate to somebody on their ads and promotional materials. On the right-hand side, we have um, our Auntie Says calendar, which really got us a lot of attention. Our transgender community here in Hawaii specifically was really um, advertised nationally and in many ways um, promoting safe sex and promoting statistics about local transgender women. And this campaign with the lovely Sina Sasan in there on the right-hand side was able to identify um, other transgender community members who have never accessed our services but did receive this message through this calendar. With that being said, I wanted to go ahead and close out our educational part of the webinar and thank everyone for joining us on this lunch break hour. I wanted to also open up to any questions and also I will turn it over to Nikki Basil, our facilitator of this day. Aloha Nikki. Hi everybody. Thank you so much, Tassie, for that uh, great presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for participating in this webinar. Whoops, you can't see my screen, so let me show it to you. There we go. So um, I just wanted to, again, thank you, Tassie, for this very important webinar. And also to let everybody know that you can access this webinar in addition to other information about Capacity for Health on our website at www.capacity4health.org. Um, on our website, you can also request free capacity building assistance if you're a community-based organization. Also, if you're interested in signing up for our listserv to receive information about our free capacity building services or trainings or products, you can click on the link on the side of the chat feature. Vanessa is going to be putting that up for you. Um, you can see it says sign up for our mailing list. You can click there and you can receive free information. Um, also just wanted to note that you'll shortly be receiving an evaluation survey via SurveyMonkey this week uh, at your email address that you use to register uh, for this webinar. And that we just also wanted to know, we really want to know your honest feedback for your webinar uh, thoughts because this helps us to best prepare future webinars. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, as an incentive um, to giving your on honest feedback, we are providing uh, gift card incentives to all of our participants who complete this evaluation. Um, so lastly, just to conclude our, um, our webinar, just want to thank everybody for joining us. And thank you again, Taffy, for walking us through this very important webinar. And so this is our opportunity to close out. So thank you all, and please keep in touch.